Chapter 8 Through broiling days and chilling nights, the wagon trains struggled along the Snake River one week, two weeks, three weeks. Several small streams came in from the south, gouging deep cuts in the earth, and to ford them, the wagons had to lurch down one side and crawl up the other. Everyone who could had to walk. Oxen lay down and died. People almost wished they could do the same. Clothing grew soiled and torn, and there, for there was no water for washing or time in which to do it. Shoes wore out, and no one repaired them. Papa would have, Papa would have. Catherine told herself he had always kept their shoes mended and sold, and buttons sewed, sewed on. But now the girls were barefoot. The days were enough, but but the nights were awful. Louise cried herself to sleep, calling for Mama. Matilda made no sound, but tears ran down her face. Hurting Catherine more than Louise's cries, she and Elizabeth lay holding each other's hands, trying not to cry, but with an awful ache in the throat. Everyone was hungry. The small remaining stocks of food had to be rationed carefully, but whatever there was, the Sager family received their share. Dr. Dagan ate very little, insisting he was too fat and needed to thin himself down. Bossy the cow, whose milk had kept the, the two smallest girls going, now gave almost none. At last came the day when, through a gap in the cliffs, the travelers saw the trail winding down to the Snake River at the famed Three Islands Crossing, one of the few places where wagons could ford the stream. But the river spread out a thousand feet wide. Here the river spread out a thousand feet wide, but a peculiarity of the current had washed sand into a sort of reef with three humps rising above the water level at this time of year. Between these islands, the sand lay in a path drivers could follow if they were clever and lucky. This was the most dangerous and most feared river crossing on the Oregon Trail. Many stories were told of wagons going down with the animals tangled in their harnesses and of men drowning in an attempt to free them. While the Sagers waited their turn at the top of the grade, John nailed up the end gate so the girls could not slide out if the cart tipped. As they began the descent, the old cart's wobbly wheels swayed from side to side on the steep, slippery trail, and Catherine could hear John yelling and Dr. Dagan swearing and not see the river. She heard enough from the men's shouts to know it was frightening evening to, even to them. She heard them fasten another wagon beside their cart and remembered that John had told her this was one way of presenting a stronger resistance to the powerful current that might sweep a single vehicle right off the narrow ford into the deep water. A sickening sideways slip sent the cart into the river, but soon it steadied. Catherine could feel the tug of the current and the pull of the sands on the wheels. Water came up through the cracks in the floor, though John had cocked them with tar. Pull your feet up into my lap, she told Louise as she felt the ice cold water curl her, but inwardly she shook as much as her little sisters. Elizabeth was shaking too, but she did not say a word. Suddenly the water drained away. The wheels moved more freely. We're on the first island, Catherine said, and felt Louise let relax a bit. But then came the heart-stopping slide again, the pull of the current around her feet. She remembered the first time they had crossed the stream, the Missouri, and how frightened Mama had been, even though the wagon had rested solidly on the raft and the strong men had pulled the sweeps. She was almost glad Mama was not here. After they crossed the third island, the ford turned upstream, and the oxen almost refused to breast the current. Dr. Dagan swore louder than ever. The whip cracked, and John and Frank yelled, Get up there, you lazy good-for-nothings! You can't turn back here! She could hear the thud of sticks on the oxen's flanks and shuddered at what her brothers were doing. They were not mean boys, and she knew they were did not she knew they did not like to beat the poor tired animals. Just then, she felt the wagon wheels hit the dry ground. All four girls were pitched backward as the oxen labored up a steep slope. They had safely crossed the Snake River. Captain Shaw headed north toward Fort Boise. Dr. Dagan, who knew a little French, told the girls the, same, the name Boise came from the French word voice, meaning trees or wood. A pleasant thought. Maybe they would once more see trees. At present, however, their trail led over dry, sandy plains and rolling hills where nothing but sagebrush grew. The staggering oxen found little to eat and less to drink, and even babies suffered from thirst. One night, the train had to, to make a dry camp with only the tiniest sips of water for everyone, water they had carried from the snake. 
At Fort Boise, there were no trees in sight and little possibility of replenishing the dragons or sorry, the wagon's train supplies. This post out in the desert did not give much despair. They were able to buy only a little jerked meat. The children had become so weak and tired that they slept most of the day. Aunt Sally Shaw baked the last of her flour into one loaf of bread and divided it amongst the half-starved children and the Sagers. There would be nothing but meat and not much of that until they reached the Whitman mission. Soon the steady meat died. diet made everyone sick, portioned out, saving a few swallows for Dr. Dagan, who was very ill. He said later that the milk saved his life. We must somehow get a broken down cow whose ribs showed plainly under the skin. She's not much for looks, but she still gives a little milk, she told the doctor. Where did you get her? Billy. She never called her husband the captain, as others did. Brought her, bought her from an Indian. For how much? He reached for his purse. Aunt Sally tossed her head. No matter. Just get just some old clothes we didn't need. Five dollars worth at most. Forget it. She drew Louise into her arms. How would you like a drink of milk, honey? Then to the doctor. If only we can keep them alive till we get to the Whitman mission. While the days were still comfortably warm, the nights were freezing cold. For the first thing families did when they made camp was build a fire. Everyone gathered around close, but one night Elizabeth overdid it, and her full calico skirt, blown by the wind, swept into the flames. She screamed, and Dr. Dagan leapt to beat out the fire with his bare hands. She was not hurt, but his hands were so badly burned that he could not help with the dragging for days. The next one to cause trouble was Louise. She still cried for Mama every night, and Catherine held her in her arms and sang to her as Mama used to do. Once she had collapsed into sleep, however, Catherine felt sure she would not move until morning, so she let herself relax. Then, one night, Louise uncovered herself, grew cold, and woke in the darkness. She had moved away from Catherine, and as she felt around the bed, found herself alone. Mama, she said softly, then more loudly, Mama, Mama! No one heard her weak little voice. She began to crawl toward the back of the cart. Somewhere out there, Mama must be waiting for her. She pulled up her little flannel nightgown, crawled over the end gate, and dropped to the ground. Mama, she cried more loudly now, but still no one answered her. Tripping over the long ground, gown, she began to run. More and more wildly, she called, Mama, Mama, then broke into a prolonged wail. Sunk deep in sleep, neither Catherine in the cart nor the boys and Dr. Dagan in the tent heard her. But over in the Shaw wagon, Aunt Sally roused. What child could be out there in the freezing night sobbing and crying? She shook her husband's shoulders. Billy, there's a lost child somewhere outside. Hear it cry? The captain stirred and swore under his breath. Whoever has let their young and get loose better find it themselves. But Billy, a child could die of cold out there, his wife argued. Reluctantly, the captain crawled out of his warm blankets and went out into the bitter night. The baby voice seemed farther away now, but he could hear the cry, Mama, Mama, where is you? Now he knew who it was, the Sager baby. But how had she managed to get out of the cart? A few minutes run, and he caught up with her and took her in his big warm arms. What are you doing out here, Louise? I went to find Mama. She, her, her carried her <laughs> typo. He carried her to the tent, stooped to get inside, and kicked at the first sleeping form he came to. It happened to be John. Better watch your little sister.